Several years ago, uh, Dr. Os Guinness, who's another leading apologist in the world, and the word, the word apologist, in case you don't understand what that means, uh, it comes from the Greek word apologia, uh, which means to get, it's a legal term in the Greek, uh, Koine Greek, uh, it means to give a defense. So it's like a legal defense. And so if you are a Christian and you're doing an apologia, you're doing a defense as to why I am a Christian. So you're defending the faith. Uh, and so Os Guinness is a, a fantastic uh, Christian apologist. Uh, I met him years ago when I first moved here. He lives in the area. I've had dinner with him and his wife several times over the last 13 years. And every time he write, writes a book, he gives me the book uh, and, uh, and, and, and blesses me with it. Now, if an author gives you a book at dinner, what should you do? You should probably read it. Because I know like every year, like when we get together, it's like if <laughs> he's going to ask me at dinner, hey, how'd you like my book? I, 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 and I didn't read it. You don't want to do that. So I love his books anyway. So uh, he gave me a book, uh, and I had a copy of it, but we had a, we had a whole bunch of copies for the last, uh, uh, last uh, worship service, but they, I think they sold them all. Uh, so this is the book. This is a picture of the book. You can get it on Amazon, wherever. Uh, it's called Fool's Talk. He gave this to me back in 2015, uh, challenged me to read it. Uh, I've read it, studied it. Uh, great book. Subtitled, Recovering the Art of what? Christian Persuasion. Christian Persuasion. Uh, it's a book on how to, uh, how to and how not to talk to the world about you. But at the, in the opening uh, uh, chapter of the book, this is what he says about the culture in which you live. He says, let me state the problem again for us Christians sharing our faith. He says, almost uh, all of our witnessing uh, and Christian communication assumes that the people are open to what we have to say or are at least interested, if not uh, in need of what we are saying. He says, yet most people are quite simply not open they're not interested, and they're definitely not needy. And in, and in much of the advanced modern world, fewer people are open today than ever, uh, even a generation ago. Then he says this, Indeed, many are hostile, and their hostility is greater than the Western church has faced for centuries. I'd agree. I mean, more and more every day, uh, the church is seen as the problem to said culture, uh, not the solution. Uh, and we're couched that way. And there's all kinds of opposition that you see and that you deal with. And so it leads to, to lots, of, lots of questions. I'm sure you've had family discussions uh, where some kind of topic came up uh, and they know you're a Christian and all of a sudden your whole family gathering, the family reunion w became a huge meltdown. Had this happen? I have. And it's like, what in the world? Uh, it's the hostility that you feel for being a Christian. Leads to two questions. How do you engage people uh, that are convinced that Christianity is a problem, that are hostile? How do you engage them uh, in a way that is... Uh, uh, positive. Number two, uh, how do you keep from being overcome by hostile said culture? Overcome in the sense that you get uh, disappointed in your faith, you get depressed, you get delusioned, maybe even derailed. And those are all the D words I could come up with when I was thinking about that. I mean, bad stuff happens to you when you look at the culture and you think, man, the evil seems to be unstoppable. Uh, how does a Christian function? How do we engage people that are hostile? And then how do you keep from being overcome? What has this got to do with Psalm 115? Everything. Uh, because this particular psalm, they believe, was written in the uh, exilic culture um, when the, the Jews are in captivity, after their country has fallen. Uh, they don't have their country anymore. They're living in Babylon. Uh, they've lost everything. And now they're living in a polytheistic culture that completely dominates them, controls them, and mocks them for their faith. Psalm 115 is a praise psalm for the type of believers that live in that culture. It's totally appropriate for us because the same things that we, they face are this, kind of the same things that we face. So how do you function in, in that kind of culture? So I've likened it unto how to be an overcomer uh, in times that are overcome by evil. How to be an overcomer when times are overcome by evil. Uh, I'm going to say a couple of things before we, we dig into the, the, these verses about this text. Um, there's an apologetic method that is listed here in this passage. I'll identify it when we get there. Um, there is a definite apologetic method, and there's multiple methodologies for how to, how to strategies for how to share your faith to a world that's hostile to it. Uh, this is just one method, so don't think what we're going to talk about is the be-all, end-all. Uh, how many are in the military? Are you excited about it? Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. 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 Are you? Are you? How many were in the military? It's like most of the church, right? So a simple question is, so whatever branch you're in, Marines, Air Force, Army, Coast Guard, whatever, you had strategies, right? They taught you strategy, correct? 
you don't just have one strategy. You have multiple strategies of how to do things. And this is what, what you're going to find in Psalm 115. So don't think what we're going to talk about is a be-all, end-all. So Fool's Talk, uh, that book by Os Guinness, uh, is a great book of strategy. And in that book, uh, Guinness says this, the deep logic of God's truth can be expressed, pay attention, both in stories and in arguments, both by questions as well as by statements, through reason and imagination, through the four gospels that are narrative literature, kind of stories, easy to read, as well as through a heavy book like Romans. Methodology, strategy. So we're going to look at strategies. Number two, I'm going to present our understanding of this particular text. It's uh, 18 verses. If you look at it from a rhetorical grammatical structure, it breaks down into four movements of thought of how to be an overcomer in tough times. Uh, but I'm going to take those four movements that are structurally put into the text, and I want to divide them up on, around an acronym, an acronym because we are a military kind of base church. Who does not understand acronyms, correct? <laughs> correct? I didn't when I moved here years ago from the West Coast. I'm at, like, first elder meeting I went to, they were talking in code to me. I'm like, you translate, please? What in the world are you talking about? Then I found out every branch has their own acronyms. It's insanity. And then you got the FBI with their own, the CIA, the DIA. I mean, they all have their own acronyms. Get together. So I, I'm just saying. <laughs> anyway, back to my sermon. Uh, so my acronym is going to be built around four letters around the world hope. Because how, how do you become an overcomer in times that are overcome by evil? Well, you have hope. And that's what these verses are about. Number one, verse one is my H. What should you do? What does it say? Hold tightly to God's character. Hold tightly to God's character. Verse one says this. Not to us, O Lord, not to us, but to thy name give glory. Why? Notice the causal clause. Well, two things. We give you glory because of thy loving kindness and because of thy truth. So he says, uh, first of all, God, in tough times, we need to have a proper perspective about ourselves because our world is totally absorbed with themselves. If you don't believe it, just go on Instagram, correct? Like, I'm not, in, I'm not on Instagram. I don't have time for it. Uh, uh, but if you have leisure time to look at it, you know, my family's on it. My, I think my daughter, is my daughter on it? Yes. Yeah, my wife's on it. I mean, people I know are on it. So I've, I've seen it many times. I'm always mesmerized by, I don't really care what burrito you had at at Cafe Rio. I don't care. I don't care what kind of salad you had at Applebee's. It doesn't matter to me. Does it mean I'm not caring? Well, I'm not about that. But the people are so self-absorbed. You see them taking pictures of their food and stuff, and it's like, do you care? Do you care? Yeah, it's like ridiculous, but it's, hey, it's cool. It's whatever. It's just, you know, checking into people. But when it comes to spirituality, what he's going to tell you here, living in tough times, it's not about you. And how do I know that? Because he says two times, it's not to us. That's a Hebrew way of saying, not about me. Not about me. Who's it about? This is about the Lord. See, my whole life should be about who he is. That should be my focus, not me. And so he says, that, Lord, when we think about the world in which we live, Babylon, and on the, all the hostility there, may we have great thoughts about you. May we hang on to you. And he says, when I think about the character of God, two, two words come to mind about God's character. He says, uh, first of all, we give you glory. And to give glory, the, word, the Hebrew word kavod means to honor somebody. So if you're in the presence of somebody that is somebody, you want to honor them, correct? I mean, there's things you would do and things you would not do. You would want to honor them and show respect to them because of their position. So he says, God, we're going to give you honor uh, because of two things. Number one, because you have loving kindness. And number two, because you are truth. Let's look at these in order. In tough times, hang on to the character of God. What is his character? He is loving and he's kind in his love. See, it's the very things our culture does not have. They are ruthless. They are brutal. They will turn on you in a second. Friends will abandon you. They will say unbelievable things about you to destroy your career, your reputation, etc. But he says, but when I look at my hostile culture and then I look at who God is, I am so thankful that he, he, he oozes with loving kindness. The Hebrew word chesed means to be loyal in love with somebody. I mean, you are never going to abandon them. That's what he's saying. God, even though we're over here in captivity in a hostile environment, one thing is for sure. Your character has told us you will never, ever abandon us, your people. You're never alone, no matter what your situation is. Exodus chapter 34, 
uh, is a great case of the loving kindness of God. Israel has sinned uh, uh, when Moses was on the mountain getting the Ten Commandments, and he comes down with the tablets. If you saw the movie, Cecil B. DeMille, he's coming down, and he sees the idolatry going on around the golden calf. He breaks the tablets, the whole shebang. Uh, then and, and God judges his people, disciplines them with a the plague. But then when you get to Exodus 34, it's a great thing about God's mercy because he circles back around, and he forgives the rebellious people, and then he reinstates them, and he gives them the tablets again. He could have said what? You get one chance, and you blew it. No more chances. You're not my people. That's not what he did. He said, I, I judged you. I disciplined you, and I'll give you the law again of how to approach me, uh, and I will, I will forgive you. Aren't, aren't you glad that God is full of loving kindness, that he's not all about wrath? Yes, he's holy, but he's 100% balanced between all those characteristics. And so he says, God, we give you glory. We honor you in tough times because we know that you haven't abandoned us even though we're in Babylon. Who ever thought in your life you would live in D.C.? <laughs> now, I know some of you are from here. This is not to denigrate you. And that's fantastic if you're from here. Praise God for you. I'm not from here. Are you? You are from here? Thank you. Just hold your criticisms for later. Yeah. <laughs> send, send me an email. Yeah, yeah. But if you're from somewhere else, that's just kind of like where you're from, huh? That's just your grid. This is your grid, correct? This is where you're born, raised, etc. All the trees, I can't see the sunsets and stuff. It drives me nuts. I'm used to the, you know, say. Yeah, but this is where you're from. So anyway, what was I talking about? <laughs> yeah, what was I talking about? Oh, for, uh, the forgiveness of God. I mean, when God moves and, and does gracious things, uh, you got to say, God, thank you that you brought me here. I mean, I say, thank you that you brought me here. I'm, I'm being me speaking. I mean, to me, it's like as difficult as it was to leave friends, family. All my friends thought we were crazy to move to the East Coast. I didn't know anybody here. Liz didn't know anybody here. I mean, it's just like, what in the world are we doing? Uh, and it's one, been one of the greater things we've done as a family because God has blessed our lives with all of you. And they've been a great church. Uh, but, and so God is a God who's very forgiving. He's very loving, kind. He's full of loving kindness. So when he does something tough in your life and places you in a tough environment, then just go with it. And thank God, thank you for moving me here. Because he wants to bless you, as we're going to see in just a minute. Um, so in tough times, uh, focus on the character of God. Hold on to the character of God. Number two, he says, uh, honor God. Honor him. Uh, because he is full of truth. Now, we've talked about this many times, and we'll talk about it again, because uh, brain cells die daily, correct? <laughs> Ever more so as you get older. Like, where's my car? Uh, honey, it's in the garage. You know? Yeah. Uh, my wife constantly asks me, how can you remember all those grammatical facts, historical facts, and everything, and you cannot find your car keys? I've actually lost my AirPods. I don't, God took them. I don't know where they are. <laughs> I have torn my garage apart, house apart, drawers apart, every pair of pants. Somebody's got them somewhere. I don't know where they are, but it's unbelievable. So when you think about God and how great God is, God is the essence of truth, Right? And we talked about this before, but we live in a culture that doesn't believe in truth, what is called a meta-narrative, an overarching story that transcends time that's always true. I mean, we're fiddling around with like what constitutes reality and denying all kinds of biological truth, medical truth. It's just, it's unbelievable to me what the culture does. But he says, we give you honor, God, because you are truth, not a truth, your truth. He's the essence of truth. I live in a culture where, uh, well, truth is just what's true to you, and it can be diametrically opposed to what I think, and that's okay, because we're just going to roll with it, man. Do you like ice cream? Do you? I do. That's why I look like the way I do. I mean, I love ice cream. Uh, I have to monitor how much I eat, but I love it. Now, Bluebell, have you had Bluebell? It's from Texas. It'll change your life. Yeah. <laughs> Now, when Liz and I first went to seminary in Dallas, Texas, back in 1981, uh, we did, we're from San Diego. We don't know what Blue Bill is. We find it in the Tin Roof Sunday. I don't even think they make it anymore. Found it in the store, bought it. Unbelievable. Unbelievable. Now they got cookies and cream and all kinds of other stuff. So Blue Bell is one brand. But then you got like moose tracks over here, right? What's this got to do with my sermon? Everything. Because if you and I were to stand at Walmart at the ice cream section, and I'm telling you, this Blue Bell ice cream is the essence of truth. It is the way to go. And you would be saying, no, brother, I rebuke you, my pastor, because it's this over here. We could have this huge argument because why? Because in our culture, we, we don't believe in truth. 
No, everything's true, and it's all just your opinion. So we can't even have a discussion about morals anymore. Why? Well, it's just your opinion what is moral, etc. I mean, there's, it's insanity. And in the middle of that insanity, what, is the, what does the psalmist say? You hold on to the fact that God is what? Truth. He's the essence of truth. Uh, John 14, 6, all, all Christians basically memorize that verse. Jesus said himself, I am the way, I am the truth, and I am the life, and no man comes to the Father but through me. That's where the preposition is most important. You don't get into heaven if you don't go through Christ by faith. Because why? He says, I am the truth. And every one of those Greek articles there is the par excellence use of the article. I mean, he's the primo. He's the most excellent one. He's the truth. In the book of uh, Isaiah chapter 45, verses 14 to 21, uh, God the Father, Yahweh says, I am the Savior, and besides me there is no other. What does that mean? It means what it literally says, that salvation and redemption is through him and through nobody else. Jesus is going to come along and say the same thing. He's part of the Trinity. He's, he's the Savior. So what does that mean? That means that anybody that believes in a system of redemption that's contrary to what is articulated in the Scriptures, no matter how well articulated, how well written the holy books, how loving and compassionate the people are, it is not the truth that saves. It is a, it is a deception. It's a deviation. And he says, Lord, we, we thank you in this Babylonian culture that, that you are the essence of truth. Number two, uh, so hold on to who God is. Study God well in tough times. Number two, organize your offense. You play sports? Nobody plays sports. This is an interesting church. You don't eat ice cream. You don't play sports. Yeah, um, you play sports? So you need two things in sports, correct? You need offense and defense, correct? Uh, you need both of those things to like have a winning team. And so as a Christian, you need to have an offense, but not being offensive about it. Who wants to be known as a great Christian defender of the faith, but you're offensive about it? You know what I mean? Because you're mean, you're angry, you yell, you scream. No, 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 no. You need to go on the offense, but do it in a non-offensive way. Notice how the psalmist does it here. So he organizes his offense living in the Babylonian culture. So what does he do? He, he's, you know, he's looking at the, living in Babylon and he says, why would the nations, these goyim, uh, why would they articulate this sarcastic thing, where now? is the Jewish God. Why would they even say that to us? We worship the living God. They, wa they worship a bunch of idols. We've seen them all around town. Why would they even make this statement? Notice his, uh, uh, he's going to develop this, uh, his response to them. But you can see how this, this would turn out. They lose their nation in 586 BC. They lost the other 10 tribes in 722 BC when Tiglath-Pileser III, the Assyrian warlord, destroyed the 10 tribes. Nebuchadnezzar comes along and three, three invasions, wipes out the other two tribes in the south, carries, levels their city, Jerusalem, invades the temple, destroys everything, takes anything that's worth anything, and takes everybody back to Babylon. And if you study archaeology and history, how they did it was they put a hook in their mouths and they ran a rope through the hook to the next guy, to the next guy. They were all in the cheek, hooked to a horse. And they went five to 600 miles like that, totally dominated by said culture. And so they get over there and they say, we're living in Babylon now. They're very hostile to us. And all we hear from them is, if your God is so great, why, did, why were we able to level your temple? If your God is so great, uh, uh, why were we able to carry away all of the holy items to where we live? You know, our gods are truly the gods. Marduk, Tiamat, Apsu. I mean, our pantheon of gods must be the gods. Where's the Jewish God? You're in captivity. See the taunt? This is just like on our culture, where they get to where they think like, well, there's a tragedy that has occurred. If there was a Christian God, don't you think he would have stopped that? The taunt. Notice how he responds to the polytheistic culture. But our God, this is his apologetic. Our God is where? He, well, he's in the heavens. Which, what's the implication? Your God is, is on the earth. See, our God is in the heavens. Uh, he does whatever he pleases. Uh, their idols, the Babylonian idols, they are silver and gold, the work of man's hands. What are their limitations? Uh, there's a whole bunch of them. They have mouths, they can't speak. They have eyes, they can't see. They have ears, they can't hear. They have noses, they can't smell. They have hands, they can't feel. They have feet, they can't walk. They can't even make a sound with their throat. Why? Because they don't really have a mouth. And then he gives a word of warning. 
Those who make them will become like them. Everyone who trusts in them. Uh, this is a word of warning. Whatever fault system it is that you follow, you will become the essence of said fault system. This is a scary thing. Because all the inept nature of a fault system of belief will become your inept view of the world, not like the belief in the true, the living God. There's methodology here. This is his apologetic methodology. So I'm going to give you, so we talked, many of you are in the military, so you have strategies for how to do things, correct? Uh, so you don't have just one strategy, you have multiple strategies uh, for how to uh, defeat the enemy. So in, in apologetics, which is, what is apologetics? It is the art of defending the faith. There are four basic models. So classical apologetics, what is that? That's what I got my doctorate in, classical apologetics. That is, if your culture, when, back in the 70s and 80s, I used evidential apologetics because everybody was believing in a meta-narrative, absolute truth, and we all reasoned on thorny issues to absolute truth because we believed in it. But since we don't believe in that anymore because we don't believe in God as we used to as a nation, we've thrown that to the wind. So now you have to back up to classical apologetics, which basically asks the question, is there a God? Is that a viable or a vacuous viewpoint? If you can establish the fact that there is a God, then you can ask the next question, well, if there is a God and there's proof that he is, that's viable proof, not a logical proof, then it's possible that he spoke. And if he has spoken, well, which holy book would we know that he spoke through? That's a whole other discussion. So that's method one. Method two is you present evidences for the faith. Uh, Josh McDowell, uh, back when I was in college, wrote a book called Evidence That Demands a Verdict. Awesome book. I've read through it many times. It's a book on the evidences for, like, the resurrection. Uh, why is the Bible like no other book? And he goes through prophecies, literally fulfilled to the letter. That no other book on the planet does that. So that's an evidential type book. Uh, there's also presuppositional apologetics, uh, where you presuppose that the Bible is the Word of God, and it is uh, what we believe. It is the most powerful tool that you can have to talk to said culture. And you start here with the Scriptures, and God uses it as the hammer uh, to destroy false thinking. It's the knife which divides between you know, truth and falsity, etc. You start with this. That's one method. And then lastly is the experiential method where you share your faith. I, uh, I was talking to a Christian the other day here at our church who shared their faith uh, with, with some educated people at work, and they were kind of frustrated because they didn't know how to answer all the, the questions that the educated person was throwing at them. So they said, I just shared my testimony with them. I'm like, awesome. You were, you were into methodology number four, experiential apologetics. Huh? Right, well, it's, it's also called fideism, but that's what you did. You shared, this is what Jesus, this is who I used to be, and this is who I am now because of what Jesus has done in my life. You cannot argue with that. So which one do you think the guy's using here in Psalm 115? It's test time. I'm going to come down and call on you individually. <laughs> no. Well, it's not number one, it's not number three, and it's not number four. <laughs> it's number two. Why? Because he's using reason and logic to tell them, have you considered your gods? Marduk, Apsu, Tiamat, you know, all those gods? Because it's just wood, and you just covered it with some gold and some silver. <laughs> Can it talk to you? No. Can it hear you? Well, not really. And if you believe wood hears you, hello. I mean, <laughs> can it walk anywhere? No, it can't even go anywhere. If it has to go anywhere, you got to take it there. See, it's reason and logic. Who would want a God like that? See, this is his apologetic method to the Jews in captivity to say, people, when the Babylonians start harassing you for believing in that great unseen God who's made all the heavens and the earth, try this method. What's he telling us? In hostile times, you might need that method. But you might need another method. But the point is, you should have some kind of method. And when you deliver that, off, uh, uh, that offense move, do it in a non-offensive non way. So think about... Uh, uh, C.S. Lewis. He's written many books. For years, people told me, you need to read mere Christianity. It's a great defense of why you should believe in God. So I, when I was a young man, I tried to read it. And I'm like, you have got to be kidding me. This is way over my head. Has this happened to you? Have you has it happened to you? I'm like, I must be totally dumb. I, this is unbelievable. I don't even, metaphysical? What does that word mean? It was way past me. And uh, so I've had to circle back around over the years and read it many times to try to get into the argument. That's one way to reason somebody toward the faith. Uh, but that's not the only way that uh, C.S. Lewis would reach people, because he used to be an atheist who came to know Christ. In Mere Christianity, he talks about how he came to Christ. 
uh, much more philosophical. But when I graduated from high school in 1976, my mom's uh, dear sister, my Aunt Roberta, uh, who battled cancer, breast cancer for 13 years and, and now is with Christ, great woman of God. When I graduated from high school, her present to me for graduation was screw tape letters. I, I didn't even know who C.S. Lewis was when I was, this is 1976. She hands me this book. I still have it. It's got a demon on the front of it. It's kind of scary looking. And she hands it to me. Dear Marty, you know, hope this book impacts you with your li- in your life, blah, blah, blah. I'm like, what? And this is my present? <laughs> and uh, so, you know, so I started reading that book that summer, 76. And I'm like, whoa, this is unbelievable. But it was a paradigm shift. You know what I'm saying? Because it's written from the perspective of a demon who is over another demon who's non-Christian, comes to know Christ, and then, wow, now what does he do? So the whole book, The Enemy's God, it just totally blew my mind. Uh, and uh, my book is so old, it's not even on the internet. That's scary. That book impacted me, just like my aunt said. But that was another apologetic way to reach people with the story. Chronicles of Narnia. You seen it? Seen the movie? Read the books? Totally different methodology. Uh, John Lennox, a great mathematician, Eng- uh, English educated, I think. I don't know if he was a con. I think it was Oxford is where he went. Um, great mathematician, but he wrote, wrote this book. I read it a couple months ago, God's Undertaker. Has science buried God? His answer is, as a mathematician, no. Let me give you all the statistical evidence why God is much, very much well uh, alive and well on planet Earth. Let me reason you toward God. That, that's a whole other approach. The, the point is, there's a number of approaches out there. Study them, use them, uh, and then bob and weave with them as you're talking to people. Uh, Hold on to God in hard times. Organize an offense without being offensive. Uh, and learn how to speak to those about you. Paul gave some advice uh, to uh, Timothy years ago. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse uh, 24, which should be advice we should listen to. It says, the Lord's bondservant must not be what? Quarrelsome. But what? Well, kind just to the people that we like. <laughs> now, kind to everybody. Able to teach. Patient when wronged. Not if wronged when wrong, with gentleness correcting those who are in opposition, if perhaps God may grant them repentance leading to the knowledge of the truth, and that they may come to their senses and escape from the snare of the devil, having been held captive by him to do his will. That used to be me. If you were a Christian, that used to be you. you. You were lost in darkness, thought your viewpoint was the viewpoint, even though you know it had many issues and it was vacuous at many points that were bothersome. And then Christ saved you. And you'll never forget that. I won't. So how do you talk to other beggars that are looking for bread? With gentleness and kindness in tough times. Third thing in the acronym, power up with trust. Power up with trust. Verse 9, O Israel, notice he's going to be very repetitious here. O Israel, trust in the Lord. He is their help and their shield. O house of Aaron, trust in the Lord. He is their help and their shield. You who fear the Lord, trust in the Lord. He is their help and their shield. He just said this three times. Why? Because sometimes it takes us a while to get things. You have children? Do they get it the first time you tell them? If I have told you once, I've told you, it's not in the Bible. I've told you what? If I've told you once, you don't use this? You said you had children. If I told you once, I told you a thousand times, right? Because they just, they're not getting it. This is God talking to you to say, look, you're my child. Let me, let me explain to you how, how you should function in a hostile environment. You should trust me. Because when you trust me, what's the effect? Well, when you trust me, I will be two things to you. What does he say he will do for you? What does he say? If you trust me, I will be your help and your shield. Why? Because if you trust me and, you, and, and, and I put you into an environment that's hostile and you're trusting me, you can bang on the fact that I'm going to show up and help you. So you're a student going back to a university and you know there's going to be some hostile professor that, you know, he goes after Christian students. Uh, should I fear? No. Should I be totally silent? No. Should I fail to write papers that espouse my viewpoints? No. I should stand for that which is truth and let the ships fall where they may and, and trust God above all things, knowing he'll be two things for me. He's going to help me write that paper. He's going to help me with my grades. He's going to help me defend my faith. And he's going to be a shield when the professor comes back at me and students do. You know, it's that kind of thing. He says he will help you and he will be, be your shield. And what I find most interesting as you look about powering up with trust, because trust is the very first thing that goes when things are hostile. Because as evil increases, you tend to think to yourself, where is God? 
I mean, if God's really around, why isn't he stopping some of this? Well, he's sovereign. He's in control. Trust him. He's got a plan. He's working it out. In the meantime, you should trust him. And what it tells us here in verse 12, I find most enlightening. It says, the Lord has been mindful of us. Notice the plural, us. He's been mindful of us. Do you think God ever looks down at your life with the angels that are assigned to you and he, the angels are giving reports and you think God ever says, I totally was looking the other way when they did X. You think you ever catch God off guard? Are you thinking about it? Point me, you never catch God off guard. Why? He's omniscient. But the thing is, he's transcendent, but he's imminent. He's personal. He knows exactly what you're going through. So say you're an educator and you're in a school environment that's hostile, and, and the cultural issues you're having to, to talk about, they, they challenge your faith, and you're like, what am I going to do? What am I going to say? How do I defend my faith in this environment? What does God say? You're in Babylon. Trust me, and I will help you, and I will defend you. I will be your shield. You willing to do that? And God knows exactly what you're up against. That's amazing. So what does he say in verse 12? The rest of verse 12, he says, uh, I love this. It's a whole long litany of blessing. He says, if you, if you, you, know, if you follow hard after God, he's going to bless you. It says in verse 12, he will bless us. He will bless the house of Israel. He'll bless the house of Aaron, the priestly line. He'll bless those who fear God, the small together with the great. May the Lord give you increase, you and your children. May you be blessed of the Lord, maker of the heaven and the earth. The heavens are the heavens of the Lord, but the earth has been given to the children of men. The God who controls the entire cosmos has his eye on you, knows your life, knows what you're up against. And if you trust him, he, with all that power, will help you and defend you. And in the meantime, he will bless your life in ways you did not anticipate as you're in Babylon. He will bless you. I like it says, it says in verse 14, may the Lord give you increase. The Hebrew says to flourish. What would I want as your pastor, but for you to flourish in your faith. This is what he says. God will help you flourish in your faith, but you got to follow his directions to get to the flourishing. So what are the directions? You're living in Babylon, whether it's D.C., wherever God has you, you're in Babylon. He says, you trust me above all things, and I will do two things for you. What did he say? I will give you help, and I will defend you, but you've got to trust me first. That's a tough one, isn't it? Uh, do I like gardening? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, I couldn't even believe they paid me to be a landscaper when I did it. I mean, I just love it. Uh, I just love it. So you would think, Anybody, I mean, I've taken weed management at UC Davis and stuff. I mean, I know about gardening and turf management and weed management, that stuff. It's my thing. This is pastoring and then there's this, there's this. I love this over here. Um, I've told my wife many times, when I retire, you might see me on the freeway with a big tractor just going up and down. I mean, I'm serious. I mean, I think that's just like, that's the job. But anyway, back to my sermon. So you would think that somebody like me that knows a lot about gardening would follow the directions for said gardening, correct? Well, have you, you know what that is? This is a Thai pepper plant, all right? Now, I grew up on the Mexican border, tons of Hispanic friends, authentic Mexican food. I'm used to it. For where I grew up, if the spoon, the, the, you know, the spoon disappeared in the hot sauce and it ate it, that's, that's caliente. That's what you wanted right there. So I'm used to hot. Ask my wife, do I like hot? Yes, hotter the better, all right? So, you know, I like Thai pepper plants. And so I plan, I, I've done them before. I plan them. You know, you, I know the drill. 45 days, 60 days, you get a bunch of little flowers. Then you get tight peppers. I know the drill. Put it out in the sun. It loves the sun, and it, et cetera. So I planted it. This year, I, made, I, I, got, I improvised. Instead of planting it in my normal spot, exposed to the sun, I wanted to see those beautiful peppers on my back patio deck. So I placed them on my deck and put some flowers around it. Now, now it's about this tall surrounded by beautiful flowers. It's totally, it's amazing. No peppers. Not a one. Not even a bloom. And I'm like praying over this thing. I'm talking to my wife. It's like, what is, this is unbelievable. This is like demonic. <laughs> what, what did I do? I didn't follow the directions. What were the directions? Sunny location. I'm a gardener. What did I do? No, I want to place it where I can see it. So I put it on my back deck which is under a 100-foot tulip poplar tree. That blocks all said son of the universe. <laughs> I didn't follow directions. And I'm sitting there looking at this plant yesterday when I was cleaning off the deck, and I'm like, I can't believe I didn't. It's too late now. It's been four months. Probability of getting a pepper now is remote. <laughs> now, think about this. Spiritually speaking, God just told you in hard times, you got to hang on to me, right? What my character is. Number, number two, the O was what? Organize an offense. And number three, 
power up with some trust. You got to trust me. You got to trust me. Will you trust me? And he says, if you trust me, I will do two things for you. I will, I'm going to help you with that situation. And I'm going to defend you with what's going to come your way after said decision. Follow the directions. And God's going to do that every time for you. Don't, don't, don't test the directions. That's the purpose of my illustration in case you're wondering. <laughs> Is he, he's preaching about Thai peppers. I don't know what that meant. That's what I was talking about. Follow the directions. Uh, lastly, what does he say you should be doing? Well, engaging in praise. Because if you live in tough times and you, you study the news and you read the news and you pay attention to the data, which I do, I analyze, I read books. I mean, I'm constantly digging in the culture to talk to said culture. Sometimes it gets heavy duty. It gets depressing. So where do you get that edge, that positive edge of, oh yeah, God's got this and, and stay in a praise because praise is like joy. Because the very first thing, when you start losing who God is, you start losing the desire to want to praise him. But what does he say? Now, we're in Babylon, but we praise God. And notice what he says in verse 17. The dead do not praise the Lord, of which I would add, no duh. <laughs> Nor do any who go down in silence. No. You ever seen a dead person praise God? I mean, it's impossible, correct? They're dead. <laughs> and so he tells you, hey, look, when you're dead, the opportunity to praise God while you walk the planet is over. What were you created for? You were created for verse 18. See the word but there? It is wedded uh, to a, the plural pronoun we. This is called a vav disjunctive in the Hebrew text. So what's supposed to be first in the sentence reading from right to left and up and down where the vowels are below the consonants, uh, the first thing should be a verb, but this is not a verb. It is a conjunction and vav connected to the <laughs> third person plural pronoun. We, he says, emphatically in Hebrew. As for us, well, how do we roll in said Babylonian culture? What do we do? We will do what? We will bless the Lord well, occasionally or only when the times are going great. No, we will bless the Lord as his people from time forth and forevermore. And then he says, hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Lift his name up high. Hallel. Lift his name up high. What should you be doing? Well, you should be having great hope in the culture in which you live because the Lord is going to return. And what should you be doing? Hold on to his character, study him well, organize your offense, power up on trusting God above all things. And when you're doing those things in the right order, you're going to be, have a heart full of what? Praise for God Almighty because you know he's trustworthy. And because he's trustworthy, he's faithful. He'll be faithful to you.